Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Um, before we get started, a few opening announcements. Um, we would love for all of you to join us on Wednesday nights. We have choir practice at 530, followed by our snack supper and a good time of fellowship. We would love to have you. And then our Bible study starts at 7 p.m. And right now we are watching um, The Chosen and um, having a discussion afterwards. So we would love to have you guys. Uh, so for more activities and dates, please check the back of the bulletin. Okay, the Lord be with you. Would you please stand and turn to page uh, 139 as we sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. Our next hymn is On Eagle's Wings, found on page 143 in your hymnal. is in this place. To worship and to rest in God's presence. Breathe deep for the goodness of God surrounds us. When you are tired 
worn down and carrying heavy burdens, God is with us. So let us join together in wonder and thanksgiving for God's love that life is up on the wings like eagles. Thanks all to be God. Amen. And if you'll turn to page 881 in your hymnal or on the screen, let's share together in our uh, the Apostles' Creed. This is an ancient text from the very early days of the Christian church. It shares, as we share together, we do so with all Christians of all denominations around the world, for these are the beliefs that we hold in common. Let us share them now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. We will gather together now and share in an invocational prayer, and we'll do so in unison. It is on the bulletin, or in the bulletin, and it'll be also on your screen. In the beginning, O oh God, you fashioned a universe. Each star and planet had a beginning in you. Out of the void, you brought light and life. Though ends of creativity, you have acted, and today we are here, inheritors of an amazing process. We are tiny specks in the limitless reaches of your universe, and you choose to be here with us, waiting to greet us. As you acted in our baptism, you are acting still to make all things new within us and among us. Let your light awaken us. Let your light awaken us and your spirit empower us for faithful living. Amen. Please continue in prayer. Lord God, we come here this morning with our batteries needing to be charged. We come here with burdens and struggles and sorrows. We come here also with hopes and aspirations. We seek to look to you for that ability to find that hope and to receive that energy to be restored in our souls and sent again into the world. Lord God, we lift up to you those things that each of us hold close in our hearts and are afraid to reveal. We lift up to you those things in our community to where people are struggling and need help. We lift up to you the mission of this church to reach out and share your word, to share your mission with all people in all places. And when we cannot find the words to say, let us always remember that prayer that your son taught us as we say it now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward and gather our tithes and offerings. Lord God, we ask that you bless our hearts and inspire our minds to serve you in all ways. Would you please stand for the doxology? that the children would come forward. smiles and twinkling eyes. It's wonderful to have that. Do you guys know what a battery is? Yes, no? Okay. What do you think a battery does? It carries energy to make things like phones and recorders and things work that we don't have to be plugged into a wall. Right? Do you guys know of anything in your home that has batteries? Mouse, okay. What else has batteries? How about your mom's cell phone? Yeah, right? Anybody, anything else you can think of? The TV. The, well, some TVs might, some plug in. The remote control has batteries. So, talk, anything else? Maybe laptops run and have batteries built in them. What happens when the batteries go dead? You gotta change the batteries? Yeah, and then, then what do you do with those batteries? Well, you, there's some you, right, some you throw away and some you recharge. You and I, all of us, are kind of like the rechargeable batteries, like the kinds that are in your telephones, right? You plug it in and let it charge back up. And you, you and all of us need that ability to recharge too, because life sometimes can be challenging and difficult and uncertain, and we run out of energy. And so when we get a chance to plug in, we get to plug into God. And what do you think the best way for you and I to plug into God is? Pray. Pray, that's right. When we can think about taking time to pray every day to God, we get recharged every day and energized more every day. Isn't that kind of cool? 
Thy tire becomes our energy source. And he, and he re-energizes that soul so we're ready for another day of adventure and challenge and loving and, and play, right? Right. And we all got to do all of those things. So what are you going to do tomorrow to recharge your battery? Pray. Pray, right. And what is a good time to pray? Um, After dinner is a good time. And any other time? Bedtime. Bedtime. Any other times? Time is a good time to pray, right? And is there any special place we got to go to pray? Well, that's a place, yes. That's a good place to pray. Any other places we need to go to pray? Church. Where? Church. In church, yeah. Any other one? And our homes, yeah. You know what? We can pray anywhere and anytime because God's always ready for us to plug in and say, Hi, how you doing? Let me get you some more juice. Okay? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for engaging with us. Thank you for knowing us. Thank you for, for being part of our everyday life, that we may draw energy and power from you, that we may go on and serve and become your disciples. And this we pray and give thanks to these children and to the people here in this community. Thank you for coming up. Our Old Testament scripture reading comes from Psalm chapter 147, verses 1 through 11, and verse 20c. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. Praise the Lord. We don't have choir this morning, right? Okay. Well, we do need those prayers. And we have a lot of lots that have been out for illness this week. So um, we will look forward to next week and hopefully great recovery. Well, I will move on to our gospel text this morning. I'll be reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 29. Actually, I'm going to move this up and go from uh, 21. Uh, through um, 39. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. And just then there was in the synagogue a man with, a, with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy, destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And, in the uncle and then the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed 
And they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obeyed him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon, mother's, Simon's mother-in-law, was in bed with a fever, and they told him, told him about her at once. He came, to take, uh, came and took her by her hand and lifted her up, and then the fever left, and she began to serve them. That evening, at the sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with, with uh, various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. This is the, um, in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a uh, deserted place and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go into the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message uh, there in those places also. For that is what Jesus came to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues, and casting out demons. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. On May 17, 2017, on May 2017, at the commencement ceremony at the University of Texas, a retired Admiral William McRaven offered a few uh, life lessons uh, to all the graduates. And, and he started off with a message and a lesson that I think is so vitally important. It's one we probably all know and all were taught, even as young ones, but it's one that's important. And I'll just share it as best I can from his words. If you want to change the world, start off each day by making your bed in the morning. He goes on to say that while such a task may seem immaterial in the scheme of all the big issues to come in the day, it is important because you begin your day by completing the first task of that day. He goes on to say that this task is important for several reasons. It is something that you do, something that you do by yourself without others. It is something that you have committed yourself to doing, and you start your day focusing on the task at hand. And accomplishing the first one, it will set you up to accomplish the next one. And you will give your small sense of pride and encourage yourself to continue to move forward to do one task after another, after another, after another, until the day is done. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that doing this little thing matters, that it's important. For if we cannot do little things correctly, then we won't be able to do larger things when they come along. And if by chance you happen to have a, had a miserable day, he goes on, you will come home to a bed that is made, made by you, made for you. And you are reminded of the importance of taking on one task at a time, even though they seem small and important, because the end result comes back to that you had a bed that was made for you to rest your, from your struggles of the day, to remind you that tomorrow begins a new day. And that there is the hope of a better day yet to come. So as you think about the message today, as you contemplate 
the teachings of Jesus and the words shared with Mark and in his Isaiah and in Psalms, be thinking about if it's important to do the small things every day, as important as it is to make that bed, why well, wonder how important it is for us to plug in to Christ, to God, each day, maybe several times a day, to take that act, to make that step, to simply say, I'm here, God. Thanks for you being here, God, and other things that are important in the day. So contemplate that. Let us pray. Jesus, we give you thanks that you have given us a place in your kingdom. We give you praise for having called each of us in this time of worship, lift our eyes beyond the boundaries that we have erected around your kingdom. Help us to shake off the limitations that we impose upon ourselves and on upon our ministries and see the ways in which you reach out to all with your saving grace that we might be part of the adventure of expanding your kingdom and spreading your love to all right here. And Lord God, I ask that you give meaning and purpose to the words that I share this morning. I pray that they are received as you would desire and set the hearts of this community on fire. I also want to read and share with you from a text from Isaiah this morning, Isaiah 40, 21 through 31. Psalms was a great and wonderful text for us to hear and listen to. It so much sets the foundation for us, as does this text. Isaiah is speaking to the people of Israel, and he says, Have you not known... Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the very beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its in inhabitants are nothing more than grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted and scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. And when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off as stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One, Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out those, their host and the numbers them, calling them each by name because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one in missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord and my rights disregarded by my God. <clears throat> have you not known, he says again, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even the youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I repeat to you, have you heard? Have you not known? This is the word of God for the people of God. The end of the text of Isaiah gives us an important phrase. One I wonder if you caught. He says, but those who wait for the Lord. 
What exactly do you think he means? Wait for the Lord. How can we wait for the Lord? Since the beginning of time, it seems we've waited for the Lord. The people in exile in Egypt waited for hundreds of years for God to respond. And then they waited and waited in the wilderness for God to send them to the land. And when they were exiled by the Babylons, they waited for God to respond again. Waiting is too difficult. Waiting requires great patience. In some ways, we could argue that we have waited enough, and yet it has been 2,000 years since Christ died on that cross, 2,000 years since he promised to come again. And we, as part of our Christian faith, state clearly that we wait for his coming again. To be honest, I don't know how to explain waiting in this, in this format because I'd like to be able to say to God, we need you to do something now. I want my ways now. I want you to do the things that I think are right and correct and powerful now. But I have no influence upon God. I have no power over God. Neither does anyone else. And I will tell you from own personal experience, God's not a great negotiator. God sets his terms, he sets his conditions, and we can take them or leave them, but God does not really negotiate with, with us. I, I, and I will tell you that from my own personal experience going into ministry. I kept trying to say and recondition and rework the terms, but God's way continues to pursue, continues to have. But I wonder maybe if we're missing the point that Isaiah is going after. Maybe it's not waiting in the context of sitting around or waiting for some other event, waiting for God to do something. Maybe the point is all about really what the term waiting means. Perhaps Isaiah in the message, do we not know, do we not hear, do we not remember the beginning, is talking about the very beginnings of our relationship with God, to go back to the core foundation for God is the creator of all things. God created the land in which we stand, the air in which we breathe, the heavens above us and the skies. God created the sciences that we continue to discover. He created this world for us to inhabit, to live, and to enjoy life. God has been here from the very beginning, long before we came into this world. And yet God knows us. God, Isaiah reminds the people then as he reminds us now. God has been a part of everything that has happened and everything then and now. He has been with us. Are we mindful of that? Are we remembering that? It's so critical. I think we go back to that core place for God is the source of all things. Isaiah is also asking us to pay really close attention to what already is, where we are, how God is already engaged in the world, how he brought Christ into this world, how he used Christ to teach, to share a message, to help us learn to trust and to rely on him. God has been confident with us. Are we willing to be confident and trustworthy and rely upon God? in God's ways, in God's time. You know, when I think about that definition of waiting, and I looked up that definition, by the way, and there is the traditional definition that we think about, one in which we delay our actions, in which we wait for some other event to take place. But there's another definition. Most of you know this definition, to serve, to attend to the needs of others. You go to a restaurant, you expect that waiter to come and and make sure you're seated, that you have the menus, that the, that the table is properly set, that you're served a glass of water or other drink orders are obtained, and, and proceed to make sure that you have a, a wonderful, joyful experience in time. That's part of waiting. And then there's a biblical term that is also equally ethical, biblical, to hope, to anticipate, to trust, a definition that requires Truly, our faith, our patience, 
our humility and the keeping the commandments means, it also means the planting of seeds of faith that will help us cultivate and nourish and tend to the fields as the seeds grow. That's all waiting. Not just waiting for God to take an action, but waiting to serve others, to serve and care. Waiting to become part of God's mission. Become part of what God is doing. To make sure the experience of others is so joyful and wonderful that they are that their encounter with God is life-changing. And then to nourish and care and tend for those seeds as they are planted, that they may flourish under our care and God's care. Our gospel text, you may say, well, what does that really have to do with it? Our gospel text comes really at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is beginning to get the word out. And he goes to Capernaum, probably one of the largest cities in the area, particularly in the Galilee area. It's the cap, Roman capital for that area. He goes into uh, a Jewish synagogue, one of the largest outside of Jerusalem. So you've got to remember the temple was huge. And if this is one of the largest outside, this building would have been massive. The numbers would have been high. Jesus goes in and begins to teach. And his teachings are so filled with the authority of God that people are, are instantly captured by the words that he is sharing. And then a demon rises, a man holding a demon rises and recognizes who Jesus is in front of all these people in the midst of the synagogue. And Jesus commands that demon to come out and to go away. He cannot speak anymore. I think sometimes... That's a hard text to grasp a hold of. You see the theme of God's power and what Jesus can do when using God's power and casting out these demons. I mean, who else has done demon casting in this world that we know of? Who has since has done any? This was a powerful event. Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, scores a home run, a, a touchdown. He, he wins uh, in a huge way oppressing people, yet why does he not want the demons to speak to yet who he is? Why is he limiting the publicity and the exposure of such an incredible event? Can you imagine sitting there and seeing that take place, being part of that moment? You've got to just think these people, when they walked out of that synagogue, were sharing an incredible message for everyone that they encountered. Continues with Jesus entering the home of James and Andrew, uh, uh, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and Simon's mother in law being ill. They share and tell Jesus that, and she, he immediately touches her, and she becomes healed. And then the text tells us that she goes on and gets up and begins to serve everybody. That's an interesting way, but maybe a, tr a wonderful way to think of that meaning of waiting, that she got up not to seek glory for her healing, not to give praise even to Jesus. She gets up to do what she can in that moment because Jesus begins healing others and casting out demons. Into the evening, into the night, he has become weary of healing so many people. I often sometimes wonder, too, about when he's doing all this healing, well, how is it touching these other people? We never hear in the text how many of those people went out and, and changed their lives and changed the way they lived. How many of them became followers of Christ? We don't know. But I have to think that each one of them, when they encountered Christ and were healed and the demons were cast out, had to have been dramatically changed. Had to have been impacted in ways we can only begin to imagine that experience, that moment. The story goes on with one more piece, and it tells us that Jesus, at, in the night, leaves and walks out of the house and finds a deserted place. 
Now, I got to think Jesus was not done healing. It was clear in the morning people were looking for him. <coughs> there were more yet to be healed. More people coming to experience this. <clears throat> but he goes and finds a place where he can pray, where he can be rejoiced. Where he plugs in to God. And I trust him. Later, the text tells us that the disciples find him. And they tell him, Come, people are waiting for you. People are waiting for him to do more miracles, to heal more people. And Jesus says, no, you need to go on. I need to share my word. I need to share my ministry to others, not just in one place. I wonder if the people who were waiting for him when they learned that he was not coming back were angry or disappointed, probably disappointed. I don't know about the anger. I wonder what they thought about the fact that he was choosing to move onward in his ministry. And maybe we need to think about that. Why would Jesus choose? He had people right there, right near him, that were needing his care. And yet he chooses to move on to share his word with others. Maybe we need to think about really what that ministry is and boil it right down to the most core element. Because every word that Jesus said was part of his mission, part of his ministry. Everything that Jesus did was part of his mission and part of his ministry. Everything that he embodied was part of that mission and ministry. And he needed to go and encounter more people. He wasn't ready for all that PR stuff. He needed to encounter people because people needed to re-experience and reignite with God. He carried the message of love, that foundational message that Isaiah referenced. Who is this person, this God, that has created all things, that is part of you? This God of love is the message of Jesus Christ, a love for God, a love for all other people, a love even for those who have harmed you and hurt you, your enemies. This is the message Healing was not the mission and was not the ministry. It was just a way of getting people to see and understand the power and the authority of God. But he carried love. He didn't have to heal anybody, but because of his compassion, his love for others, he came to teach. He came to change. He came in a ministry to make a difference in individuals' lives. And then those individuals who had that experience can carry and share and and give that to many others. That's the ministry that continues here in this church. It needs to be a ministry of love to others. You don't have to get caught up in all the detail and all the refined little issues. What we need to know is the core essence of Jesus Christ and his message was to love God and to love all other people, helping them change their lives they enter into a relationship with this God that has created the world and created our very essence. If we can do that, we can make a difference here in this community, in this place, one person, one life at a time. That's all our mission is. That's all we're called to do. Go share God's word. Go share God's message. One of the more powerful ways to respond to God's message is to be able to share in Holy Communion, to be able to, together, through Christ, to be part and retouched and recharged. I ask you to prepare your hearts for Holy Communion and to turn to page 12 in your hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. And we have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of you. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us when we are yet sinners. That's God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. We turn to page 13. We will continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. is your son Jesus Christ that by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection you gave birth to your church you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit on that night when Jesus and his disciples had gathered together in that upper room Jesus takes a loaf of bread he gives thanks to God, and he breaks the bread. And then he passes the bread to his disciples and said, Take, eat of this, each of you. For this is my body, broken for you. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. As the meal drew towards conclusion, Jesus takes the cup of wine for us juice. Again, giving thanks to God, he passes his cup to his disciples and said, Take, drink it from this. This is my blood poured out for you and for everyone as a new covenant. No longer the covenant of a lamb, the blood of a lamb over the lintel, but his blood as the new covenant poured out for each of us. As often as we do this, we do so in remembrance of him. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This United Methodist Church we believe that this is Christ's table. Christ's table is created and extended to all people who come. As you come forward this morning, come down the center aisle, move to the, uh, the usher, the head usher will guide you to move on to the altar. You may stand or kneel at the rail, and our usher servants will, uh, stewards will serve you. Put your hands in the form of a cross, and they'll put a piece of bread in your hand, reminding you that this is Christ's body, broken. And they'll offer you a cup reminding you that this is Christ's blood poured out for you. The table is set. The invitation is made. Please come.
Will the community stewards please come forward? Let us turn to page 2129 in the faith we sing and stand for our closing hymn. It will also be on the screen.
Amen.